to Lesson 5 of our eight-week study, Living with Hope. Now, we're halfway through our study. And Lesson Hope is entitled, Living with Sorrow. And in this lesson, we're going to study what sorrow is. And we're going to look at some examples of biblical men and women uh, who also live with sorrow and see what we can learn from them. Let's begin with prayer first. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for what the Bible teaches us about sorrow and how you have the answer for sorrow. And we're going to look at some examples that are written in your word about saints who went before us and what they dealt with. And, and we will examine um, how they handled this sorrow. Lord, we praise you for your word. We thank you for your guidance in our life. And Lord, it is our intent to glorify you with this study. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, before we begin our review on Lesson 5, let's listen to a song. It's called, He's Been Faithful to Me. Thank you. 
Well, in our previous lessons, we studied how fear, worry, despair, and depression can keep us from living with hope. In lesson five, we studied how living in sorrow can keep us from living with hope. Let's now review our lesson on sorrow. First, we will look at what sorrow is, what it does to us, and how we can deal with it biblically. Then we will review our examples from the Word of God. Number one, page one. Living with sorrow is something we have all experienced to some degree throughout our life. Just like fear, worry, despair, and depression, we sorrow because we live in a fallen world. Sorrow came from the curse when Adam sinned. We learn from the experiences from these three saints in our lesson for this week. Hannah, who sorrowed over not having something she desperately wanted yet didn't have. David, who sorrowed over the consequence of his sin with Bathsheba. Jeremiah, who sorrowed over the sin and the coming destruction of his homeland. Now, we know that we are not unique in our sorrow. Sometimes that may be how we feel. For example, we each have sometime wanted something desperately, yet we didn't receive it. And a few examples could be material things such as a home, a car, etc. Or maybe it was education or a certain job or traveling. It could also be harmony within family relationships. Or it could be having children or grandchildren. And it could also be having good health. And we have all sorrowed over the consequence of our sin. For all of us, this sorrow led us to believe by faith in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of our sin. We understand that we need a Savior and we believe by faith that Jesus is the only way to have peace with God and be saved. We trust in Him alone. Also, in our Christian walk, it is good to sorrow over sin, over our sin, because it leads us to godly changes. Paul is writing to the carnal saints in Corinth, whom he addresses over their sinful behavior. Notice that Paul mentions godly and worldly sorrow. Now I rejoice, not that ye were made sorry, but that ye sorrow to repentance, for ye were made sorry after a godly manner that ye might receive damage by us in nothing. For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. Now godly sorrow leads us to a change of thinking and behavior. Worldly sorrow does not. Worldly sorrow is when you're sorry you did it, but you do it again. You really haven't changed your thinking about it in your heart. What you're really sorry about it is that you got caught. Also, many of us have sorrowed over the loss of a loved one and have found the Word of God to be our true comfort. We have found that our four-step plan from Philippians 4, 6 through 7, which we use to confront fear, worry, despair, and depression, helps us in our sorrow over our loss. We understand as well that in our sorrow... We will be in constant prayer as we grieve and adjust to our new life. It's not something you just pray about once or twice. You're going to be continually praying to the Lord as you seek to recover from this loss. The Lord is nigh unto them that are of a broken heart and save us such as be of a contrite spirit. That's Psalms 34, 18. Now page 2 top of the page be careful for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving let your requests be made known unto God and the peace of God which passeth all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus Philippians 4 6 through 7 and we've broken this down into four steps step one recognize that you are in sorrow Realize God will lead you out of your sorrow. Step two, take your sorrow to God. Ask him for comfort and the strength to move out of your sorrow and to adjust to a new life without your loved one. Step three, be thankful. Thank God for all the good things he has already done for you. Step four, trust God that he will lead you out of your sorrow. You have taken your sorrow to the only one 
who can truly help you and believe, now believe that he will, then receive his peace. We also have each sorrowed over the sin in our country, our homeland America. We sorrow over the ever-increasing immorality and violence. We sorrow that our Lord and Savior has lost honor in the places of governmental leadership. We sorrow, too, because we sense the coming persecution of those who love the Lord and for the looming destruction of our homeland. And we are reminded of Proverbs 6, 16 to 19, of these things the Lord hates. These six things that the Lord hate, yea, seven are an abomination unto him, a proud look, lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood a heart that devises wicked imaginations, feet that be swift to in running to mischief, a false witness that spreadeth lie, and he that soweth discord amongst the brethren. I think as we think about that, that summarizes so much of we see what we see happening in our homeland today, and this causes us to sorrow. And we'll look at someone else who also sorrowed later on in our lesson, and that's Jeremiah. Back to our outline. Let's more closely examine what it is to sorrow. Well, how does sorrow affect you? The state of being sorrowful happens when you have suffered the loss of something good in your life. Your mind is uneasy or in pain as you grieve and miss what you have lost. You may even feel sorrowful to the point that you are overwhelmed by your loss. There are many reasons for sorrow, and a few of them are. Number one, the loss of a loved one. Two, the loss of a job and finances, the loss of health, and the growing uncertainty in life. Also, we need to consider and be mindful that if we don't handle our sorrow biblically, we leave ourselves open to becoming bitter or angry. To keep from doing this, we need to accept the following biblical truths. God knows things in our lives God allows, excuse me, God allows things into our lives at his timing and for his purpose, and it is for our good. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose, and that's Romans 8, 28. We must remember that God is always at work in our lives, being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ, Philippians 1, 6. He is always at work in our lives until we draw our last breath. God is always at work transforming us into the image of his son, Jesus Christ. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son that he might be the firstborn amongst many brethren Romans 8:29 and page 3 at the top God loves you and he always will so when these things are going on coming into your life changes that you are making and they're difficult grieving over your sorrows adjusting to this listening to the Lord in prayer remember that God loves you and he always will and walk in love as Christ also hath loved us and hath given himself for us an offering and sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. Ephesians 5, 2. And we know that this past year in particular has been a rough year for most people everywhere. And it seems to be, to a certain extent, continuing on even into this year. Some have suffered from the COVID virus and, and have even lost a loved one to COVID and to other diseases. Some have lost a job in finances. 2020 has turned our way of life upside down. We sorrow over the growing idolatry and corruption in our society. We see it all around. We hear it every time we turn on the news. We miss the old America that we love. Now, being sorrowful can rob us of our peace and make being hopeful difficult, which is why we're studying this topic of sorrow and how we can deal with it biblically. However, God desires for us to have peace and to have hope in him, not in the world, 
Everything that's going out in the world will not give us hope. That's pretty sure. Our hope is lying in the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's review the examples of sorrow in the lives of Hannah, David, and Jeremiah and learn from how they each dealt with their sorrow biblically. We know that God's word has the answer for our sorrow. Well, we first looked at Hannah. Well, who was Hannah? Well, we know that she was born around 1100 B.C. and may have been a contemporary with Samson the judge. She lived during the time of the judges when Israel had no king. And it will be her son Samuel who will later anoint Israel's first king, who is King Saul. Hannah is only found in 1 Samuel 1 through chapter 2, 21. She is not mentioned elsewhere in the Bible. Hannah is one of the two wives of Elkanon, and his second wife was Peninon. I hope I'm saying that right. Hannah's husband, Elkanah, was a descendant of the tribe of Levi. We know that from 1 Chronicles 6, 26, and 33. And he was called an Ephraimite, uh, Ephraimite because he lived in the hill country around Mount Ephraim which was northeast of Jerusalem. Now, Hannah's name means grace and favor, and Peninnah's name means precious stone or pearl. And I'm sorry if I didn't pronounce her name right. Now we're going to look at Hannah's sorrow since we got some of the background information on her. Well, we know that she was barren, which was a source of shame because children were considered a blessing. So if you didn't have any children, you weren't being blessed. Elikon's second wife, Peninnah, continually provoked and made fun of her for being barren because she had sons and daughters and she would hold this over Hannah. The annual sacrifice. Um, Elikon and his two wives, Hannah and, oh dear, I made a mistake, Hannah and, uh, it's not him, but that should be his, his second wife's name, which is... Uh, Penahan, P-E-N-N-I-N-N-A-H, if you want to pencil that in. Well, they traveled 30 miles to the tabernacle in Shiloh to make their annual sacrifice. Now, the reason why Shiloh is where it is is that the tabernacle was centrally located amongst all the tribes, and it was located in Shiloh because that was a good central location. Now, later, the tabernacle was moved to Jerusalem following a time when the ark was lost to the Philistines in a war. However, when David recaptured the ark, he took it to Jerusalem, and then later, David's son Solomon would build a temple to house the ark. So that's why they were going to Shiloh, and that's why the tabernacle was there. And then later, the ark was moved to Jerusalem, and later after that, a temple was built in Jerusalem. Now, B, Elikon gave portions to sacrifice to Peninon and her children, but he gave a larger portion to Hannah. And he had a special love for Hannah, and he tried to comfort her um, for coming each year to Shiloh Childless, and he knew that she was desperate to have a son. Page 4. Well, Hannah had a plan. After the family meal, she left and sat on a seat by the post of the tabernacle of the Lord. And there she wept and she prayed. She took her sorrow for being childless to the Lord. She poured out her heart to the Lord in prayer. Now Hannah made a vow that if the Lord would give her a son, she would give him to the Lord for service unto the Lord. Well, while this was going on, someone was watching Hannah. Eli the priest saw her and as she was pouring out her heart in prayer to the Lord. However, as she was praying, her lips were, were moving, but her voice was silent. So she was moving her mouth, but no words were coming out. Now, Hannah was praying, though, in her heart. But Eli thought she must be drunk, so he confronted her, telling her to stop drinking the wine. Now, Hannah's response to Eli the priest, uh, Hannah told him she wasn't drunk and she hadn't even had any strong drink. She was full of sorrow and was pouring out her heart to the Lord. Now, Eli the priest made a promise to Hannah. He told her that she would receive from the God of Israel what she had prayed about. After Eli told her this, she wasn't sad or sorrowful anymore. Now, previously she had no appetite, but now her appetite re 
nocturne, and she went back and ate. And I think maybe this is a good time for us to stop and recall a time when you shared a dilemma with someone seeking godly counsel. Think back to a time in your life when you were stressed out or in sorrow and, and you went to someone seeking good godly counsel. Remember how your spirit was lifted up after they spoke to you about the Lord and the true hope that you have in him? Think how you felt so much better. Well, this must have been the way Hannah felt after Eli talked to her about the Lord's promise to her. Now, we know that Eli's promise from the Lord was fulfilled. The Lord heard Hannah's prayer, and she conceived and had a son. Eli's promise came to pass. She named her son Samuel, saying, Because I have asked him of the Lord. Hannah keeps her vow to the Lord. When Samuel was weaned, she and her husband, Elkahan, took him to Eli the priest and gave him to serve the Lord. Now, according to Jewish custom, a child was weaned anywhere between 18 months and 5 years of age. It suggested that Samuel was likely between 2 and 4 years old because of 1 Samuel 1.24, and the child was young. Now, when a child was weaned, it was a big event. For example, Abraham had a feast when Isaac was weaned, and the child grew and was weaned, and Abraham made a great feast the same day that Isaac was weaned, and that's in Genesis 21.8. Now, due to the high infant mortality rate in the ancient cultures, a child was expected to live into adulthood when they were old enough to be weaned. They had gotten past that kind of dangerous period of time when they were subject to dying from different diseases. So... Hannah took, her, took with her an offering of three bullocks, one epith of flour, and a bottle of wine. She told Eli that she had brought the son she had prayed about. He is lent to the Lord for as long as he lives. She left him with Eli, and Samuel worshipped the Lord there. Page 5. Now we know that Hannah loved Samuel and thought about him and his needs. Every year when Hannah came to offer a sacrifice at Shiloh, she brought with her a coat for Samuel. After he grew, he would need a new coat, and she provided for his needs. You can just imagine as she was working on that coat each year, what she was thinking and reminding herself about how she was given Samuel and what Samuel must be doing now. So she had a, a, a great love for her son. Now, we read that Hannah's prayer of joy in the Lord. It is recorded in 1 Samuel 2, 1 to 10. Hannah had personally experienced God's grace in her life by God's answer to her for a son. God even gave her more sons than daughters. Hannah's dilemma was no more. God took it away. Now, this prayer shows that she was a woman who knew God and trusted in him. She took her sorrow of being childless to him in prayer. As soon as Eli told her that God was going to give her a son, she was no longer sad. She trusted in the Lord and the promise the Lord gave her through Eli the priest. Let's examine this beautiful prayer. And when I was looking into this and what I was reading on it, this is considered to be one of the most beautiful prayers in the Bible. And Hannah prayed and said, My heart rejoiceth in the Lord. Mine horn is exalted in the Lord. My mouth is enlarged over mine enemies, because I rejoice in thy, in my, in thy salvation. 1 Samuel 2, 1. Well, we see that Hannah's prayer begins with her praising God for what he has personally done for him, for her. She finds her greatest joy and strength in the Lord. She praises him for being the source of her joy and strength. She praises the Lord with all that is in her heart. God has caused her to prevail over her enemies. And perhaps her enemy was uh, Peninnahi, who was uh, her, the second wife, who used to shame and mock her for being childless. Peninnahi brought her low, but the Lord lifted her up. Now, she rejoices because the Lord removed her humiliation and gave her a son. God has saved her from the shame of being childless. There is none holy as the Lord, for there is none beside thee. Neither is there any rock like our God, for Samuel 2.2. 2. 
She praises the power, strength, faithfulness, and holiness of the Lord. He is unique. There is no God like him. She leaned upon God as her rock during her sorrow of being childless. God has made her life stable by giving her a son. Talk no more exceedingly proudly. Let not arrogancy come out of your mouth. For the Lord is a God of knowledge, and by him actions are weighed. The bows of the mighty men are broken, and they that stumble are girded with strength. They that were full have hard out themselves for bread, and they that were hungry ceased, so that the barren hath borne seven, and she that hath many children is waxed feeble. For Samuel 2, 3 through 5. Well, we see how Hannah's prayer broadens to include the world and mankind. One, she cautions others not to be arrogant and think they control the outcome of their actions. Hannah may have been thinking of how prideful Peninnah was toward her since Peninnah had children when Hannah was childless. And God knows the thoughts of every person and God sees everything we do. God is a judge of all our actions and everything that we do. Page 6. The Lord killeth and maketh alive. He bringeth down to the grave and bringeth up. The Lord maketh poor and maketh rich. He bringeth low, low and lifteth up. He raiseth up poor out of the dust and lifteth up the beggar from the dunghill to send them among princes and make them inherit the throne of glory. For the pillars of the earth are the Lord's, and he hath set the world upon him. That tells you she knew something about how the Lord made the world. He will keep the feet of his saints, and the wicked shall be silent in darkness. For by strength shall no man prevail. The adversaries of the Lord shall be broken to pieces. Out of heaven shall he thunder upon them. The Lord shall judge the ends of the earth, and he shall give strength unto his king, and shall exhort the horn of his exalted of his anointed, excuse me, 1 Samuel 2, 6 through 10. Well, we see how Hannah's prayer now describes how man deals, how God deals with mankind. One, God is sovereign over all things. God controls life and he controls death. God controls poverty and wealth. God humbles, God exalts. God has made the earth and it belongs to him. God is a judge over the earth. God will destroy those who oppose him. God will protect his saints. And there is also a prophecy of God's actions in the lives of Samuel, David, and the nation Israel. The ultimate anointed one would be Jesus Christ, who is Lord over all. Now, from this prayer, what is our observation? And I would say it is Hannah was a woman who had a great faith and a strong relationship with God. In her sorrow of being childless, Hannah's faith to the Lord led her to take her request to him in prayer. Well, now next we're going to look at David, and he is known as a man after God's heart. Now David, number 12 there, David was used by God in many ways, yet David was no stranger to sin and sorrow. In this lesson, we read about David's sin that resulted in his sorrow over the death of his child. First, a few facts about David. Well, David lived between 1040 and 970 B.C., which spans 70 years. He was the youngest of Jesse's son, and as a child, he was a shepherd. He had musical ta uh, talent and could play the lyre, which is similar to a small harp. He played the lyre to soothe the king Saul, which is how David became one of Saul's armor bearers. Now David slew a lion and a bear to defend his father's flocks, and then he, he also slew the giant Goliath when no one else would face the challenge. Now when King Saul died, David replaced him as king, and David organized Israel and subdued their neighboring nations. He was a strong warrior and won many battles for the Lord. Now, much has been written about David's character. There's been many books written about him, about his character, his talents, his strength as a warrior. But it is the Lord who best describes David. 
Now this is Samuel speaking to Saul. But now thy kingdom shall continue. The Lord has sought him a man after his own heart. And the Lord hath commanded him to be captain over his people. Because thou hast not kept that which the Lord commanded thee. For Samuel thirteen, fourteen. Now later on. Paul speaking to the men of Israel, page 7. And when he had removed him, speaking of Saul, he raised up unto him David to be their king, to whom also he gave testimony and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after mine own heart, which shall fulfill all my will. Acts 13, 22. Doesn't that just say it all about David? I mean, that's an amazing thing to be considered a man after God's heart. Now we will learn about David's sin with Bathsheba and his resulting sorrow. Now really what this is, now we, this is our reading on this question, and this is a summary of 2 Samuel 11, 1 to 24, and then 2 Samuel 12, 1 to 23. Now instead of going off to war with his men, David stayed home. He spent time on his rooftop watching Bathsheba as she bathed. He then learned that she was the wife of Uriah, an officer in his army. He was one of his mighty men. Now Uriah was not home because he was off at war. In spite of this, David sent for Bathsheba, and she conceived a child with David. Now after she told David she had conceived, he sent word to Joab, his general, to send Uriah back home. David was hoping to cover up his idolatry by providing Uriah an opportunity to lay with his wife Bathsheba, so Uriah would think the child was his. However, Uriah would not indulge this privilege since all the other men were off fighting a war. He was an honorable man and did not want to have privileges the other men didn't have. B. Well, since David's plan didn't work, he sent Uriah back with a letter to General Joab. In the letter, he told Joab to put Uriah in the very front of the hottest battle so that he will hit, be hit and will die. As a result, Uriah was killed in battle. As soon as Bathsheba's time of mourning was over, she became David's wife. However, the Lord was displeased with what David had done, so he sent Nathan the prophet to confront David about his sin. Nathan exposed David's sin to him by telling him a story about a rich man and a poor man. Now this rich man had many flocks and herds, but the poor man only had one little ewe lamb, which is a young female sheep. The poor man loved his little lamb, and it was his constant companion. He fed it, and the little lamb laid in his lap. While the rich man, when the rich man showed up, instead of taking a lamb from his many flocks, he took the poor man's ewe lamb, and he killed it to eat. Now David was very angry against this rich man and said that he deserved to die for doing this. Now the prophet Nathan then told David that he was just like that rich man because he had taken Uriah's one wife and then had Uriah killed to cover up his adultery with his wife. Now David had done this in spite of all the Lord had allowed him to have. Because of this, evil would rise up in his household. Now, therefore, the sword shall never depart from thine house, because thou hast despised me and hast taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be thy wife. Second Samuel 12.10 Well, because of David's sin, the, the child that he had with Bathsheba would die. After Nathan left David, the child of David and Bathsheba became sick. David prayed, laid on the earth, and would not eat. Yet seven days later, the child died. All his servants were afraid to tell him that his child had died, fearing he would become even more sorrowful. However, when David was told, he got up, washed and changed his clothes, and went to eat. His servants didn't expect this, and when they asked David about it, David told them, page 8. And, and he said, While the child was yet alive, I fasted and wept. For I said, Who can tell whether God will be gracious to me that the child may live? But now he is dead. Wherefore shall I fast? Can I bring him back again? I shall go to him, but he shall not return to me. Second Samuel 
12, 22 to 23. Well, we see how David's hope that sustained him during his sorrow. When he learned his child was sick, he sought the Lord's mercy in prayer. When the child died, David accepted the Lord's will. David's hope sustained him in his sorrow. He knew he would see his child again. I shall go to him, but he shall not return to me. 2 Samuel 12, 23. David had peace. With this peace, he stopped fasting, got up from the ground, and he ate bread. Well, our observation. Do you see how David's response to his sorrow actually followed our plans from Philippians 4, 6 through 7? Be careful for nothing, but everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which patheth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and mind through Christ Jesus. Philippians 4, 6 through 7. Well, now we're going to look at the life of the prophet Jeremiah, a man who sorrowed over the sin of Judah. And this is our last um, biblical character that we're going to look at as we examine sorrow. Number 15. Jeremiah's life as a prophet of the Lord. We need to get some background and facts on Jeremiah. Jeremiah was born in Judah between 650 and 570 B.C., so that spanned 80 years. He grew up during the reign of righteous King Josiah. Uh, remember, Josiah was the one that went around tearing down the idols the, the, for the false god, and he tried to reestablish the Lord's commandments in Judah. He grew up during the reign of a righteous king Josiah of Judah who reigned from 640 to 609 B.C. Now some accounts say Jeremiah was 17 years old when he began to prophesy. Others say he was closer to 23 years old. In either case, Jeremiah was a young man when he began to prophesy. Jeremiah was a prophet for 40 years from the 13th reign of King Josiah until the fall of Jerusalem in 586 B.C. He prophesied during the reign of three kings of Judah, Jeremiah, Jehoiakim, and Zedekiah, ending with the destruction of Jerusalem by the Babylonian king Nebuchadnezzar. Now, Jeremiah is called the weeping prophet because he sorrowed over Judah, which was the southern kingdom of Israel consisting of two tribes. Now, the northern kingdom of ten tribes had previously fell to the Assyrians in 722 B.C. Jeremiah's calling of the Lord. Jeremiah was a prophet of the Lord before he was even born. The word of God came to Jeremiah saying, Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. And before thou comest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee. I ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. Jeremiah 1.5 now, Jeremiah didn't think he could speak as a prophet because he was still a child. But the Lord encouraged Jeremiah when he touched Jeremiah's mouth and told him that he had put the words in his mouth. The Lord also encouraged Jeremiah to not be afraid. Page 9. Be not afraid of their faces, for I am with thee to deliver thee, saith the Lord. Jeremiah one eight. C. Now, Jeremiah's purpose, why God made him a prophet, and what he intended for him to do was to root out, bring down and destroy nations as well as to build up and plant nations. Now, Jeremiah would be the messenger of bad news to the king so he would continually face opposition and he would be unpopular. His life would not be happy. D. Now, Jeremiah rebukes Jerusalem, remembering their, the former years with the word of the Lord. Go and cry in the ears of Jerusalem, saying, Thus saith the Lord, I remember thee, the kindness of thy youth, the love of thy apostles, when you went us after me in the wilderness, in a land that was not sown. Jeremiah 2.2. 2. There, there was a past relationship there that now was going away, doing to uh, Judah's sin of idolatry. Now we will look at 17, Jeremiah's treatment as a prophet of the Lord. And this is just one example. And his prayer to the Lord. 
Pasher, who is the son of the priest and chief governor in the temple, heard that Jeremiah was prophesying the destruction of Jerusalem for their idolatry by their enemies. So Pasher beat him and put him in the stocks, and the stocks were used to inflict punishment near the temple. Now the next day after doing this, when Pasher removed him from the stocks, Jeremiah began prophesying the word of the Lord again. Speaking the word of the Lord, Jeremiah told Pasher that the Lord does not call him Pasher, but calls him Magor Misabib, which means fear on every side. This describes the fate to come upon Pasher and his family who would be carried to Babylon to die there. To die there. Jeremiah describes how all of Judah would be given to the king of Babylon. Now, following this, Jeremiah begins to pray to the Lord about how he is being treated. O oh Lord, that hath deceived me, and I was deceived. Thou art stronger than I, and, and hast prevailed. I am in diversion daily. He's troubled daily. Everyone mocketh me. He took this concern that he had to the Lord, Jeremiah 27. Then Jeremiah laments that he tried to stay <coughs> excuse me, tried to stay still and not speak the words of prophecy against Judah, but he simply could not. But his word was in mine heart as a burning fire shutteth up my bones, and I was weary with forbearing, and I could not stay. He just couldn't do it. Jeremiah twenty nine twenty verse nine. Now, wherever Jeremiah went, someone was always looking for an opportunity to take revenge against him. He had enemies everywhere for what he was prophesizing. He was telling them to submit to Babylon. This, he, they are God's agent to punish you for your sin of idolatry. However, uh, Jeremiah was comforted. And had confidence because the Lord is stronger than his enemies. We're there on letter E. But the Lord is with me as a mighty, terrible one. Therefore, my persecutors shall stumble, and they shall not prevail. They shall be greatly ashamed, for they shall not prosper. Their everlasting confusion shall never be forgotten. Jeremiah 20, verse 11. Then Jeremiah praises the Lord for delivering him from the evildoers. He, his focus was on the Lord. Sing unto the Lord, praise ye the Lord, for he hath delivered the soul of the poor from the hand of the evildoers. Jeremiah 20, verse 13. Jeremiah is praising him for the deliverance that God has given him from those who would do him evil. 18. Jeremiah's example to us, well, he is an example to us of obedience to God in spite of severe persecution and ridicule. He stood firm for God even when doing so made him unpopular. And we maybe need to take pause here and recognize that as an example of obedience, um, more and more we need to be aware of as persecution increases, that we need to make our mind up that we too are going to stand firm for the Lord. B, he is also an example of taking our concerns to the Lord in prayer and praising the Lord. Also, page 10, our last page, when we have sorrow over the idolatry in our country, we can remember how Jeremiah continued to obey God and his truth as he too sorrowed over the idolatry in Judah. And I think he's a real example to us for that because we do see an ever-increasing uh, behavior of idolatry in our nation, don't we? Now, we ended our study of Jeremiah by considering two verses from the book of Lamentations, a little bit about the book of Lamentations, number 19. Tradition holds that Jeremiah is the author of Lamentations because its author had witnessed the destruction of Jerusalem by the Babylonians. Support for this is found in Second Chronicles 35:25. B, lamentation means someone who grieves, mourns, or weeps to express their deep sorrow. Seeing his beloved Jerusalem destroyed caused Jeremiah to weep and be sorrowful. He had seen the temple was destroyed. Everything was burned down. The walls were destroyed. People were hungry, and 
it, it was just a desperate situation. He wept over Judah's unrepentant idolatry. They had turned to worshiping false gods, which was the cause of God's judgment upon them. However, in the midst of all the destruction that Jeremiah saw, he still had hope. He saw hope. It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. Lamentations three twenty-two to 23. Now our lesson asked us to not do two things. One, write these verses in your own words. And two, explain how these verses give you hope. So here's what I came up with. Number one, in my own words, if it wasn't for God's never-ending mercy, I would perish. Life would just be too hard. But God gives me mercy and compassion every day. Great is God's faithfulness. Now, how these verses give me hope. I can always rely upon God's mercy every moment of every day. He never fails to provide what I need. I don't have to worry that God will change his mind because he cannot change and he does not lie. He will do what he says he will do. His mercy and compassion are life-saving cushions as I go through my life full of knocks and bumps. Knowing I can count on the faithfulness of God gives me hope. And this is an interesting note. The hymn, Great is Thy Faithfulness, is written by Thomas Crislam, and that was between, he lived between the ages of uh, years of 1866 through 1960, and it was based on Lamentations 323. It is of the God's mercies that we are not consumed because his compass compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. I think that's a hymn we're all familiar with and we all love. Well, ladies, uh, our next lesson, which is lesson six, will be or is on anger. Well, let's close in prayer now. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for your great faithfulness, and we thank you that your mercies are new to us every day. And Lord, we praise you for you alone are God. You alone are our Savior. You are alone are the focus of our life. You give us life. And Lord, I just pray a blessing as these women study their next lesson. Guide them and lead us and bring us all together safely next week. And Lord, I just, I just pray that we bring you glory with this study and that we honor your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.